Hey everybody and welcome to another edition of Beer Googles, double E, double O, double G. Today we're going to talk about a fun phenomena, uh, kindly dubbed the Mandela Effect after Nelson Mandela. The reason it's called the Mandela Effect is because there's a woman, uh, her name is Fiona Broom. She's a self-described paranormal consultant. And she said it was in reference to her false memory of the death of South African President Nelson Mandela uh, in prison in the 80s. But he actually was released from prison and served as president of South Africa. He actually died in 2013. But she claims that she has this vivid memory of this happening. And I think even uh, his a widow giving a speech as well. Uh, and she said there, it was claimed, uh, she said it was claimed, the memory was claimed to be shared by thousands of other people or perhaps thousands. So that's the Mandela effect. Um, I was going to share 10 fun little Mandela effect uh, things in your life that might blow your mind. It'll make you question reality itself. And I'm going to start with the first one. Um, many people have played this game since childhood and as parents and as adults, the game of Monopoly. Um, for decades, Rich Uncle Pennybags, or Mr. Monopoly, the guy on the cover, you know, on the box, uh, the mascot for Monopoly, right? Um, they insist that uh, he has that full tuxedo attire with a monocle. But no, there is no monocle. He's never worn a monocle. So people be, appear to be conflating his depiction with that of Mr. Peanut, who also is dressed in that tuxedo garb. But no, he does not have a monocle. And I think there was a woman on Twitter, I think TikTok, actually. And uh, I think they did articles on it. I think the, the video went viral. She was crying in her bed and she was saying how the dimensions changed because her whole life, Mr. Monopoly had a monocle. And he actually never did. So that may blow your mind if you guys have that picture of the guy with the mustache and the cane and the top hat. I also can totally get the monocle thing, but Mr. Peanut is kind of that conflation because he was also dressed like tuxedo style. Speaking of peanuts, the next one, if you look forward to your school lunch break because your parent or guardian packed Jiffy peanut butter sandwich, your childhood may be a lie. Jiff and Skippy brands exist, but there's never been a Jiffy brand. So what happens is there's a conflation of two of the very popular uh, brands, Jiff and Skippy, and it becomes Jiffy. So now, I, now it's like ingrained in the memory, boom, done. So that's an interesting one as well. The next one is from a famous movie, Silence of the Lambs. It's uh, st stated by uh, Anthony Hopkins. The tense meetings between imprisoned cannibal Hannibal Lecter and FBI agent Clary Starlin, I think that was uh, Jodie Foster, fueled 1991's Silence of the Lambs based on the Thomas Harris, Harris novel. Hello, Clarice, has become a default line reading for people looking to emulate Anthony Hopkins' creepy Lecter. But the killer never says the line in the movie. Instead, he says... Good morning. When meeting Starling for the first time, people remember Lecter greeting Starling and remember him saying Clarice in a melodic tone, creating a false memory of a classic non-quote. Your memory can try to recreate things based on available evidence using context clues, Brewer says. And Brewer's uh, one of the psychologists on this uh, in this article. So that's an interesting one as well. I always said, hello, Clarice. Fava beans. Um, yeah, and Anthony Hopkins is creepy AF, so, and probably, like, super, like, awesome to hang around, because he's that crazy. But the next one I have, the Fruit of La Bloom label. So anybody who's had the underwear with the Fruit of Loom, there's a bunch of fruit. I remembered as well, I could swear that the, there was a cornucopia of fruit, which is that horned thing at the end that all the fruits stuffed into. But it was never coming out of the basket. It was always illustrated as just a pile of fruit. So it was interesting that um, we did that. Um, so what they say is uh, 
the more exposure we get to things like advertising, the more memories for things become decontextualized. In other words, people who remember the cornucopia may not have a distinct memory of pulling on a pair of briefs and saying they remember the fruit was involved. They may get to think how, oh, well, how fruit is, how fruit, how is fruit usually portrayed? Maybe a cornucopia. So they push it all together. I think that's probably how I would have thought it have been like, it's got to be in something, right? Like something's got to hold the fruit. Why is it just a pile of fruit? It's kind of strange, but I don't know. Um, the next one that I have, number five of 10, is uh, Leonardo da Vinci's frowning Mona Lisa. Leonardo da Vinci's painting is among the most famous works of art in recorded history. So why do so many admirers insist the demure subject of the portrait is frowning instead of correctly describing her with a smirk? Brewer can't say for certain, but conjuring an image of the painting might involve filling the blanks with segments of other paintings. It would be interesting to look at the set, uh, statistical frequencies of frowns, not smiling or smiling in paintings, he says. Maybe people are just taking the statistical regularity of the art environment. People get exposed to a lot of art where people aren't smiling. So that's an interesting one. I never really thought about that one, but when I think about it, I always thought she was more stoic, not frowning, but just stoic. But she does actually, now that I look at it, does have a little bit of a smirk. So the next one, Ed McMahon. You are correct, sir. Uh, Ed McMahon and the Publisher's Clearinghouse. Wrong. Nope, it was not the Publisher's Clearinghouse, ladies and gentlemen. He was part of the... Uh, American Family Publishers, which is not the people with the balloons and the checks going door to the prize patrol of the uh, Publishers Clearinghouse. So um, obviously you remember Ed McMahon. You think that he's part of that, but he's not. He's actually part of a different one, the American Family Publishers, not the uh, Publishers Clearinghouse. So that's an interesting one. I guess I would have done the same thing, but I just remember him standing there doing his little... You could win. You could win big. Uh, uh, it was a very great uh, impression by Phil Hartman in, in Saturday Night Live, for sure. So, All right, number seven. The next one we have, the Berenstein Bears. The I love this one because I um, would spell Berenstein, B-E-R-E-N-S-T-E-I-N. S-T-E-I-N, Stein, like Berenstein Bears, Berenstein Bears. And it's actually Berenstain Bears. It's a B-E-R-E-N-S-T-A-I-N. But if you were asked probably like to write it out, if you remember like the cover, you would have probably spelled it Berenstein, S-T-E-I-N. So it's just one of those ones that you just, uh, you were just exposed to misspelled words and uh, they misspelled words get you know popped in your memory and whatnot so it's an interesting one the next one for all you nerds out there that would be including myself c3po's golden moment the mandela effect is strong in star wars fans who sometimes err in quoting the film's dialogue but also recall protocol droid c3po as having a gold-plated chassis and he does with one notable exception the lower portion of his right leg below the knee was silver when we first saw him, a fact that sometimes surprises people who have seen the original trilogy dozens of times. People trying to reconstruct an event are taking whatever information they can, which can mean glossing over things or making inferences, Brewer says. Unless you started at the droid's leg, you probably just assumed he was all the same color or he was the same color all over. And I do remember that in uh, the original. Help me, Obi-Wan. Am I any help? Um, that's an interesting one, too, because everyone does think. And I think a lot of people always thought, like, super shiny. But he was, like, pretty dirty at some points. So the next one is an interesting one because a lot of people get dressed up f as this character uh, from the movies for Halloween. It would be Tom Cruise's character in Risky Business. If you remember the Halloween costume, everybody's picturing it right now. It's like a white button-down long sleeve shirt, underwear, socks, and sunglasses, right? Aha! 
Remember Tom Cruise dancing in his underwear, a dress shirt, and Ray-Bans while home alone in the 83's Risky Business? That would be 1983. Your brain got most of it right. If you watch that now iconic scene again, you may be surprised to see Cruise isn't wearing sunglasses. The mistake likely comes from seeing Cruise in the shades in other scenes of the film, uh, in other scenes or in the film's advertising material. When you watch a movie, it's a big chunk of information, Brewer says, and a lot of things happen in that chunk. When you go back to recreate it, you'll get interference from other things that happen in the movie. And that is true because I think the cover is like red, red and black kind of border with uh, Tom Cruise with the Ray-Bans on. So, and that is a thing. Everyone wears the sunglasses, so they conflate that scene, even though he did not wear sunglasses in the scene. Last one, everybody. My, this one, I, I remember this one crazily as well. So it kind of reminds me of the Jiff and Skippy thing. So Shaq, Mr. O'Neal, Shaquille, multiple time champion. He was in a couple movies. And he was in a movie called what everyone thought Shazam because his name was Shaq, but it actually was Kazam. So that's the 10th one. The most startling example of the Mandela effect, the widespread belief that an entire feature film exists titled Shazam, starring actor and comedian Sinbad as a genie. What people are re recollecting is probably Kazam, a 1996 comedy starring NBA's great Shaquille O'Neal as a wish-granting mystical figure. Part of the confusion stems from the fact that Sinbad appeared in several children's films in the 1990s. One of them, First Kid, reportedly had a preview for Kazam on the VHS release, which could have strengthened the tendency to reconstruct the actor as starring in it rather than O'Neal. This is one, or this one is so convincing, even Brewer himself says he caught himself remembering it. So actually, it wasn't that it was Shaz uh, not the movie Shazam, but Sinbad in Shazam, not Shaq in Kazam. And that movie never existed with Sinbad. So that's a very interesting one. So those have been 10 fun little Mandela effects. You will come across a ton of these. If you uh, beer Google uh, Mandela effect, you'll see like ones that say like 50 and 40. I wasn't going to bore you. I was going to try to keep it nice and succinct. Oh my gosh. I made it under 15 minutes, ladies and gentlemen. Very proud of myself. Um, you could do me a favor. Please subscribe, follow, rate, review. Love to hear from you. Love to hear feedback. If you have some Mandela effect stuff, send it my way. I'd love to uh, be happy to uh, talk about it or to post it. So send it to info at notconscious.com or at what is it at knocked con on Twitter? I think so follow us. Love it. Thanks so much for joining us. We will be here. Uh, today was, uh, actually it's Thursday, May 6th. This will be released tomorrow, May 7th, Friday, but, um, on May, uh, is it 11th? I think on Tuesday, I've got, uh, a friend of mine, Frankie J from the, uh, Frankie J has a podcast. He's got some uh, cause he works on. So I love the story. So I had a nice little conversation with him. And then uh, we're going to play that uh, on Tuesday. Thank you, everybody, for joining me again. I hope you guys have a great day. Take care.